Okay, so we're looking at functions here again. This is going to be a lot of review, but there's quite a bit of stuff in here. So um, we've you've talked about before in college algebra and algebra two combining functions, composition of functions, inverse functions, those kind of things. So we're just going to go over that information again. So the first thing, um, let's say we want to know whether an equation is a function. Well, one way we can do it is just look at the graph of it, and from the graph we can tell if it passes the vertical line test. That's fairly simple. However, in calculus, let's try and be a little more sophisticated. So let's take this first one. So we have x plus y is equal to 1. So what we want to know then is if for every x value, there's exactly one y. So if I solve this equation for y, and then I say to myself, okay, if I'm going to put x values in, like a 1 or a 2 or a half, am I only going to come up with one value for y? And if your answer is yes, then it is a function. So this first one is a function. Okay, on this one then, let's go ahead and solve the second one, x squared plus y squared is equal to 2. So I'm going to solve it for y. So we subtract the x squared from both sides. Then we need to get rid of the y squared, so then we take the square root. So we get plus or minus the square root of 2 minus x squared. So notice on this one then, when I substitute in values for x, so when I square it, subtract it from 2, I get a value, but then I take the square root, so I could get a plus or a minus. So in this case, not every x yields one y. We could get two y's. So no, this one is not a function. It's going to be important um, when we do inverse functions to know if it's a one-to-one -one function because um, only, only functions that are one-to-one -one actually have an inverse. And what that means, one-to-one, -one, is not only does it pass a vertical line test, but it passes a horizontal line test. So let's take the function y is equal to x cubed. Okay, well, let's take a look at it, at it graphically first of all. So we know we have the point zero, zero on that curve. One, one. Come on. Two, eight. So it's going to be up here. Negative one, negative one. And negative two, negative eight. So our curve looks something like this. So we can see that it passes a vertical line test. So therefore it is a, f a function, but for one to one then, it also has to pass a horizontal line test. And we see that it's crossing only one time. So graphically it's pretty easy to see that it's one to one. Here again, if I look at the equation and I substitute in an x value, any number that I cube, I'm only going to come up with one value. So for every x, there's one y. Now if I solve it for the x, so I take the cube root of y. So the cube root of y is equal to x. So now if I substitute in a y value in here, and I take the cube root of it, well, because it's a cube root, if it's a positive 8, like we'll get a positive 2. If I substitute in a negative 8, I would get a negative 2. So every y value is also yielding 1x. So um, there is more of a, a more sophisticated y, way to see if they're one-to-one -one functions. Okay, you remember evaluating functions. Uh, for example, if we have f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 3, and I ask you to find f of 2, that simply means that you replace the x values with 2. So we would get 2 squared minus 2 times 2 plus 3. So the value of this function would be 3. All right, well, we're going to take this same function then, and we're going to find this. Find f of the quantity x plus the change in x. 
All right, now this is going to take a little bit of room, so let's get ready to spread out here. So we're substituting in the x plus the change in x for both of the x's. So we've got to take that binomial and square it first of all. And then go minus 2 times that quantity. And then at the end, add 3 to it. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and simplify it. So let's multiply it out. So we get x squared plus 2x change in x. Plus the change in x squared. Then we'll distribute the negative 2, so minus 2x minus 2 change in x plus 3. All right, let's take a look for like terms. x squared change in x. No, these two are pretty close, but they're not. This is a 2x change in x, and that's just a 2 change in x. So I don't have any like terms, so that is what we get when we evaluate f of x plus the change in x. All right, now what we're going to do is go over here then and look at this difference quotient. And what we do to evaluate that is use what we already have. So notice we just did this piece of it. Okay, and that's what we have written in this last row here. Okay, so then it says, take that expression and subtract, subtract f of x. So f of x is what we originally started off with. So it says subtract x squared. So if I subtract off an x squared, then that's gone. Then it says subtract off a negative 2x. So if I subtract um, a negative 2x, then this is gone. And then it says subtract 3. So if I subtract 3, then that is gone. All right, so for the numerator then, we just have left 2x change in x plus the change in x squared minus 2 times the change in x. All right, now it says take that expression, that whole numerator is what we have now, and it says now divide it by the change in x. And notice that the change in x is in each one of those terms up in the numerator, so we can factor it out. So they all have in common a change in x. So if I bring it out to the front then, the first term is now just 2x. The middle term has just a change in x to the first power. We're taking one of them away. And then the last term, we just left with the 2 because we're taking out the change in x. So now that the change in x in the numerator is a factor, now it will reduce. So 2x plus change in x minus 2 is what we get when we find the value of this whole expression. We get just what's left here inside of the parentheses. All right. So now I've got one here that you can go ahead and um, try this one. Write it down, pause it, write it down, and then go on, and then we'll check to see how you did in class. Let's move on to combinations of functions. So I have uh, two separate functions here. f of x is equal to 3x minus 2, so I've got a linear function, and the g of x is a quadratic function. So when we're combining functions, we can do things like add them together. And to add these two functions together then, we just combine the like terms. So I'm going to list it. I'm going to take the negative x squared first of all, and then it looks like the only x term is the 3x. And then I can combine the negative 2 and the positive 4, so we get plus 2. 
So that's all that, whoops, I guess I could put an X here. That means just combine those two functions by adding them. If we want to subtract, however, we have to be a little bit more careful. So it says take the 3x minus 2, begin with that function, and take away the second function. So take away the 4 minus x squared. So we want to subtract the whole function. So it's very important to remember that we have to distribute that negative sign. So at this level in calculus, there's really not any excuse for missing distributing here. So make sure it gets distributed to that second term. So when we subtract those two functions, we get x squared plus 3x minus 6. Okay, we can also multiply the two functions. In this case, to multiply them, we would have to um, double distribute or FOIL. Maybe some of you are used to that term. Um, if I divided the two, let's say that we wanted g divided by f of x. Okay, so the numerator then is going to have the 4 minus x squared. The denominator, we're going to have 3x minus 2. So if we looked at this function, would you be able to tell me what the domain is? So we still need to remember all of that stuff that we did in the last um, chapter. So the domain here, since we have a uh, rational expression, we're concerned about dividing by 0. So we want to see what makes this equal to 0. And it looks like a 2 thirds. So our domain is all real numbers except two-thirds. So that's our only restriction. I'll make that a comma. Okay, that's a quick, quick review of combinations of functions. We'll do more in class. Okay, next we want to look at composition of functions. Now, composition of functions is where uh, you have an inside and an outside function and you have to apply one rule first before you do um, the other thing. Let's just take two separate functions. Let's say f of x will be the function, uh, let's go with 1 minus x squared. And then for g of x, Let's say we have um, 2x. All right, so for the composition, it looks a little bit differently, so you have to be careful. Actually, it looks a lot like multiplying, but instead of a dot, it's an open circle. F composition g of x. Okay, this function, the second function, is the inside function. And that whole function there, the 2x, is what you substitute in for the x in the outside function, which is f in this case. All right, so to get the composition here, it would be 1 minus the quantity of 2x squared. So if we wrote it without the parentheses then, we would write it as 1 minus 4x squared. Let's try the composition the other way. So g, oops, open circle, that's going to look goofy. g composition f of x. In this case, our inside function is the f of x. So we take the 1 minus x squared and place it in for the x in the outside function. So the outside function is 2 times x. We take out the x and put in 1 minus x squared. So we would get 2 minus 2x squared. All right, that is composition. Inverse functions. For inverse functions, let's take a look at it um, kind of intuitively, first of all. So let's say that f of x is equal to the function x minus 2 over 3. 
So if you take a look at this function and we were going to evaluate it for different values of x, and I'd say, well, what would you do? What's the order of operations to evaluate that? Well, given whatever x, you have to subtract 2 from it first of all and then divide by 3. So the inverse is undoing that process. And remember that has that inverse notation. We have that little negative 1 up in an exponent, and in this case, it does not mean the reciprocal of it. It means the inverse. So the inverse of subtracting 2, then dividing by 3, is multiplying by 3, then adding 2. So from the original function, then, you go the um, opposite direction and the inverse operation to be able to find the inverse. Now, let's say we wanted to do that algebraically. And algebraically, inverses um, are where we interchange the x and the y values. So if we take the original function f of x, remember the f of x is your y value, well, we're going to interchange the y and the x. So the f of x becomes the x, the x becomes the y. So we've interchanged the x and the y, so this then is going to be the algebraic way to come up with the inverse. Now we solve that equation that we have right there for y. So we're going to multiply by 3. and then add 2. So we get y is equal to... Okay, sorry about that. That was Haley. All right, so we've got to add the 2 to the other side, so we get 3x plus 2. And what do you know? That's what we came up with intuitively. So there's the algebraic way of finding the inverse. For a function to have an inverse, it must be one-to-one. -one. So let's go over that definition of a one-to-one -one function. Um, let's take the function f of x is equal to 2x plus 3. Okay. So we can look at it algebraically, since that's a simple linear one. We know what it looks like. Um, it crosses the y-axis at 3. It has a slope of 2. So we've got a linear function. And we can see that it passes the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So that means it does have an inverse. So once again then, to get the inverse, we can interchange the x and the y. Or a fairly simple one like this is just go ahead and do it intuitively. All right. Wow, this pen is there. f to the negative 1. Okay, let's try that again. f inverse of x. Okay, instead of multiplying by 2, then adding 3, we subtract 3, then divide by 2. So that is our inverse. And remember, um, an inverse then, if all we do is interchange the x and the y, then what happens graphically then is that the um, coordinates of the original function if we just interchange them, we'll get coordinates of the other one. So, for example, instead of the point 0, 3, the point 3, 0 will be on the inverse. And instead of the point 1, 5, the point 5, 1 will be on the inverse. Okay, so here is our inverse. And remember, another property is that inverses of each other are symmetrical to the line x is equal to y, which makes sense because all we're doing is interchanging the x and the y. So if you fold the uh, blue line over the green one, it's going to end up in the red because we're interchanging the x's and the y's.
All right. So an example of a function that does not have an inverse would be f of x is equal to x squared. Okay. For every x, you have one y, but for every y, you don't have one x. So graphically, we can see that it will pass the horizontal line test, but it does not pass a vertical line test. So we don't, we say this function here does not have an inverse. The only way we could get an inverse is if we restrict the domain on the original function. So if we said, well, how about if I just look at the graph of f of x is equal to x squared from 0 to the right. So if I put in a stipulation here that says x has to be greater than or equal to 0, then I see that it is a one-to-one -one function, so it would have an inverse. And the inverse of that half, the right half of that parabola, would look something like this. Because once again, it's going to be reflected over the line y is equal to x. Okay, so I want to, oops, I guess that's not the screen. I don't want to, um, I don't know what happened to that. I got all these screens with the credit on it. So once again, just a thank you to um, Hutton Mifflin for uh, the textbook that we're using. And it's going to help us in our study of calculus.